Welcome back to another episode of the North Star Takes Podcast. I'm Bailey Pawlicki. He's Jacob Liberta, and we're a Minnesota sports podcast. So if you're a Minnesota sports fan, please click that like button and also hit the subscribe button on this channel as well to get more Minnesota sports content on your feed. And today we're going to be talking Minnesota Vikings. Uh, just a couple, you know, rumors from the last day or so here to clean up. So let's just jump right into it. Obviously, probably the bigger one is that uh, J.C. Treader's story came out as he officially has retired from the NFL after receiving no interest from any teams, amazingly, after being a top five graded center by Pro Football Focus over the last several years. Um, odd situation. I mean, he's got knee issues, but as he said in this story that came out with SI.com, he thinks his knee issues are you know behind him or he thinks that they're manageable and that he's still able to play, but he believes that no teams want to sign him due to his status as the president of the NFL Players Association. And, you know... Once again, it's kind of the NFL with their whole blackballing thing. We've seen this from time to time with several players, notably Colin Kaepernick. But, um, I mean, it's just it's, it's kind of crazy that, you know, the, the NFL politics that come into it. It's like, you know, if you have a chance to upgrade, especially the Vikings, if you have a chance to really upgrade at center and move on from a, you know, a complete liability like Garrett Bradbury um, to not even consider it just because this guy is the head of the Players Association. I mean, that's just bonkers to me. So what were what were your thoughts when you heard this story, Alberta? Yeah, I really don't like this. I, I think everything Charter is saying is probably face value, or sh you should take it at face value because I don't think the stuff he's just making it up. So I, I think he is getting blackballed by the league, and that's highly unfortunate. That's a bad look for all the ownership groups out there, like for instance, in the Vikings case specifically, like, I mean, he mentioned he was, he was a fan of the Vikings way back when like, growing up. So it's mm -hmm. like, it felt like a natural fit for us. Cause that's the biggest hole on our offense. Bradbury's been a disaster ever since he came here. So like, felt like, well, in a year that it appears we're trying to win in, then why don't we go make a move for a guy like that? And we just didn't even, didn't even give him a chance. He didn't even give him a workout. It's like, at least see what he looks like. And yep. it's, it's especially puzzling when, like, for instance, quick easy, we know, because in Cleveland for the last number of years, uh, both of them were. So it's like, well, then what are, what are we doing? Like, why? Oh, I think we're back. Yeah, there we yeah, go. We're back. Okay. Yes. As I was saying, anyways, it's, it's like, yeah, quite crazy and, and Turner are both in Cleveland for the last number of years. So it's like, you know what you're getting, at least relatively. So, yeah, this really disappoints me. It would be nice, a lot nicer to have a top five center in there, especially for like the contract you would uh, sign him for really at this mm -hmm. point would be very economical and very team friendly. So it's like, why would you not do that? Especially when Bradbury, like there's a good chance he's going to come into the season, get a few weeks in and it will be bottoming out at the bottom of the uh, center rankings, I guess, as far as PFF goes and especially PFF grades and then pass blocking. It's just awful. So it's like, why would you not? get this guy that can help Kirk tremendously. It just, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's like, what, what issues are we really like standing firm on that we wouldn't cross, so to speak, cross the line to sign this guy. Like it just doesn't, make, it doesn't add up. I don't know what's, what's happening behind the scenes with this, with these ownership groups. Like this is just unacceptable. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, there's from what we've seen, at least, you know, you know, reported by, you know, the NFL networks or ESPNs or whatever. It's like there really hasn't been any beef between the players union and the owners, at least, that, you know, for what we know. And yeah, it's, it's insanely troublesome that a guy like JC Treader can't get a job. I think he's still only like 30 or 31 years old. He's only mm -hmm. played like eight years in the league. Yeah. These um, offensive linemen get points until they're relatively old. Exactly. And like you mentioned at this point in the season, the Vikings would be, and he mentioned in the story as well, like he wasn't, you know, demanding, a big contract. He actually said he was asking for less than what he knows he's valued at. Um, it, you know, it wasn't a veteran minimum, but it's like, you know, the Vikings have cap space. There's quite a few other teams that could use a center that have cap space and nobody even, you know, put in a call on them. The Browns mm -hmm. have lost, I think their top two centers yeah. this preseason. They didn't, yeah. they didn't even give him a call. It's like, I mean, this is What's just, deal here? yeah, this is just damning stuff. I just, it's unfortunate and you know i'm sure he doesn't care too much like i'm sure he's disappointed but he's on to bigger and better things as he mentioned as well in the story and he's really focusing on um you know being a stand-up guy for the players and their union so you know hats off to him but in terms of just the vikings alone it's it's incredibly disappointing that you know i'm sure there's some sort of behind the scenes agreement between all the owners and you know front office employees etc that and you know no, nobody's going to sign this guy 
Yep, and therein lies the problem. It's all these these back channel, back door, behind close curtain agreements yes. between these thirty two ownership groups. Like that can't that can't be the case anymore. Like in today's day and age, there can't be things like that happening. Exactly, I couldn't agree more. So it sucks because you know Bradbury's probably going to cost us at some point this season. Um, yep, he absolutely and will. And I'm really worried about him these first couple of weeks against some really good defensive lines. So <laughs> yeah, they'll absolutely. Learn- They'll learn quickly uh, what a mistake this is. So Yeah, it, it, like you said, it could literally happen right away in week one. Like Kenny Clark is just going to eat his lunch. And then yes. uh, you like you think it probably can't go like any worse than that. Like Then I think it will. But then it's like you own uh, Philly week two on Monday Night Football and you're going to hit the big old Jordan Davis just the athletic freak. Yes. So it's like, oh, yeah, it, that's going to go much better. So it's I, I don't uh, – that really grinds my gears. We know exactly what's going to happen. We're weeks away from it. But once it happens, it's like, are, is the Vikings organization, all these people are just going to look around at each other and go all woe with me and be like, wow, I can't believe this happened. Like, no, yeah, just put their on. hands up. Yeah, exactly. Are we sticking our heads in the sand right now? What are we doing? Yeah, let's let's move on to kind of another questionable decision here. Obviously, you know, this isn't a super impact player, but uh, the Vikings have decided to cut Jordan Berry and they're rolling with their rookie punter, Ryan Wright, I believe, if I have his name correct. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only reason that this is interesting is punting-wise, I think it's probably a horse apiece between him and Jordan Berry. Wright actually might have a little bit better of a leg. But in terms of holding for field goals, um, it's been reported throughout training camp that when Greg Joseph has had Jordan Berry holding his kicks, he's been magnificent. And when Ryan Wright's been holding the kicks, he's that's when he's been missing. So... What are your thoughts here? I mean, what do you think the thought process is with them rolling with a rookie punter and messing with the special teams? I know it's a whole new regime, and they haven't been here through all the special teams, uh, trials, and tribulations of the previous regime, but it kind of seems like they're just, you know, writing the same script. I don't love this. This is like three or four training camps in a row where the incumbent punter has been cut for in favor of some other no-name dude. And it's like, especially this guy, when you're like as – evidence like you said in training camp as Greg Joseph's been attempting all these field goals at practice like it's not gone well with him as a holder I get that the reps aren't necessarily there yet because Barry is probably taking most of them so he's probably had limited time doing that so you'd think it'd get better over time yeah like I, I just don't like messing up with messing up a uh, guy's cadence like that like Greg Joseph's just because like he's had a strong training camp so like I would rather feel good about my three-man unit going into those uh, extra point field goal kicks during the season, then like they're just in sync, then having some extra yardage on a punt. Like, um, yes. I'm good. Like, you can't tell me this right guy is that much of a needle mover from Barry as far as punting the football. So it's like, why, why are we really doing this? I mean, I'm willing to give it a chance and hopefully they find a holder, whether it's right to whoever on the team that's going to work with Greg Joseph and we don't have to go through some sort of uh, growing pains period at the beginning of the season, especially when we're like playing the Packers week one. Like, mm-hmm. hopefully that doesn't happen. Hopefully they can get that ironed out in the co- next couple weeks. But I am skeptical, unless my conspiracy theory here is are they going to, if it's not right, are they going to entertain how it used to be with like back quarterbacks? And that's the way that they find Sean Mannion a roster spot. Like, oh, yeah, he's a good holder. Is that how we're going to keep him on the team? Like, I sure hope not. Wow. But that's just a, that's a far off conspiracy theory I'm throwing out there. But if that if that actually happens this week where we're rolling Sean out there for these extra points and field goal kicks, oh my gosh, I'm smash a clipboard like that. that uh, if that's, that's like if that's some backdoor way, be like, oh, yeah, we need to keep this guy on the team. Oh my gosh, that'd be so that's stupid. That's an incredible conspiracy. I love that. I think. I mean, if that's the case, then they end up having to cut Kellen Mond or put him on practice squad or whatever. I mean, that's just a shameful decision. I mean, you know, Mond is his own thing, and I certainly wouldn't want him holding uh, for extra points and field goals because he can hardly catch shotgun snaps. But, like, yeah. I mean. Roll Kirk out there. <laughs> it's just, if yeah, if you're right, if they find a way to get Sean Manning in a roster spot still, especially, like, it could potentially cost you special teams-wise, like, give me a break, man. I mean. I don't want to freak out too much because it's just a punter. Like, you know, yeah. hopefully the offense is good enough this year where he's not asked to punt a ton. Hopefully we're not kicking a ton of field goals. But, I mean, if Greg Joseph starts to struggle, this kind of stuff's going to come under the microscope, no doubt. Um, and, no, you know, if we were fans of any other team, we wouldn't even be thinking about this kind of stuff. We'd be like, oh, yeah, they just cut the punter and we have a new punter. Who cares? But we – too many times. <laughs> yes, far too often. Like you mentioned, the last three or four training camps, punter gets cut, rookie punter comes in. Um, we've had some holding issues, whether it was Jeff Locke in the past, or I think Matt Weil kind of struggled with holding too. Yep. Um, just, yeah, just interesting, interesting 
special team situations we've had. And, you know, Greg Joseph's having a great camp, and I'm sure they've, you know, talked to him about what his preference is. So I would imagine this was somewhat okayed by him. But at the same time, it's just puzzling when the evidence is right there that he's done better with Jordan Berry holding. I know, exactly. And that's that's the only thing. that None of this matters if – he comes out and he's hitting his first five, 10 kicks of the season. Then it's like, whatever, this is just an afterthought. Like it's no big deal. But like, if we struggle early on, especially in like your biggest rivalry game of the season that you really want to win, especially in O'Connell's first as in O'Connell's first time as the head coach of the team, like against the Packers at home, like you want to win that game, but it comes down to us missing kicks. Like I'm going to have a pretty heavy inclination to want to blame that. So like, uh, uh, this is worth monitoring as the season begins here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any other final thoughts from you before we kind of head into this last preseason game? It sounds like basically none of the starters are going to play again. I guess, is there anything you're really looking forward to seeing, or are you just kind of ready to get to the regular season? Uh, is Mullins going to play this Saturday? I think so. It sounds like Kellen Mond's going to get quite a bit of run, which he should. Um, yeah. I would imagine Mannion gets a little bit too, but I would hope they get Mullins in at least for a few drives. Yeah, that's basically all I'd be looking forward to, really, because I don't think there's anything else that's going to be of high interest here in this last game. I think we've seen all we need to see in these first two preseason games outside of that. So, yeah, that's that's about it. I would imagine guys like Andrew Booth and Lewis Seen probably won't play because they've been kind of nursing some minor injuries. Mm -hmm. So get them healthy and rested and ready for week one, you know, for whatever their roles may be. I think – it's, I've been a little discouraged that Lewis Seen, I guess, hasn't like grabbed that starting safety spot, given that he's a first-round pick. But he was the last pick of the first round, and I guess it's encouraging that Cam Bynum has you know, had a good enough camp where he has that starting role. Mm -hmm. I just hope as the season progresses, they're able to kind of find a role for Seen. As for Booth, I think naturally he's just going to be able to get in there because you know, I think either Patrick Peterson's going to struggle or you know, we'll have an injury at corner for sure. Yes. So, I mean, I'm not worried about Booth getting his playing time, but I'd like to see – Lewis seen kind of step it up a little bit. Yeah, me too. I'm in the same boat. Obviously, we want to see our top two draft picks play a little bit. And, you know, our third draft pick, Ed Ingram, he's going to probably start. So, like, yeah. I'm looking look forward to that. And sounds like Asamoah is really showing out. So, yep. I think he'll probably get a surprise amount of playing time even pretty soon than people are expecting. So, Yeah, I think Asamoah, without a doubt, is the third linebacker right now. So, that's super encouraging. I mean, potentially these top four draft picks that we had this year could all be very good contributors and most of it on the defensive side of the ball, which we really needed to retool back there. But yeah, exactly. I know we were saying that in the middle of last season. It's like, well, what what players are we hanging our hats on as far as young pieces that you can envision being yes. here beyond the next like year or so? Like it was literally Cam Bansler knows it. Like outside yeah. him, uh, you kind of had a hard time looking for him. But now, now you feel like you've kind of replenished those cores at uh, all three levels. So our yeah, I mean D line, we got Patrick Jones who's coming along, but still, yeah. like I I think there's there's a lot to like there. Yeah, and looking way ahead, I think this sets up next year where it potentially could be an offensive heavy draft, whether it's, you know, drafting your quarterback, maybe another receiver, um, you know, maybe more offensive linemen, interior offensive linemen, and then potentially an edge rusher too. Because I think defense, we're kind of starting to fill out the the more more or less boring spots. We've been drafting corners. Sure. Um, we're deep, we're super deep at safety all of a sudden. Um, linebacker isn't looking amazing, but I still think you can kind of fill that position as we're kind of seeing this year, like you sign a Jordan Hicks. Um, you get you draft an Asamoah, a guy that has you know potential, and maybe he can fulfill that potential. So yeah, and um, plus you shouldn't be playing a lot of linebackers in right. general anyway, with the way our defense probably will line up. Correct. Yeah, if, if Zadari Smith and Deion Hunter are technically outside linebackers, then that also takes up a lot of your linebacker space as well. But that's a different conversation for a different day. We'll wrap it up there. That will do it for this edition of the North Star Takes Podcast. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, please click the like button on this video and subscribe to the channel and help spread the word about our Minnesota sports conversations. Uh, feel free to give us a follow on both Twitter and Instagram and let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. What do you think about the JC Treader story? Uh, what do you think about the Vikings rolling with a rookie punter? And just any other storylines you're looking forward to as week one is fast approaching here. So until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>